Every year, over 180 million metric tons of sugar are produced across the globe. That's enough to fill 72,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. But have you ever wondered, how does sugar actually go from a rugged stalk in a field to those pristine white crystals in your kitchen? What does it take to produce a million tons of sugar in just one factory? Today, join Factory X as we explore the secrets of one of the world's most amazing industrial processes, the massive, multi-stage transformation of raw cane and beets into the sweet stuff we can't seem to live without. Background The Origins of Sugar Long before the age of smokestacks, turbines, and conveyor belts, sugar was not a common kitchen ingredient. It was a treasure, a delicacy so rare and precious that it was sometimes referred to as white gold. Long before it was mass-produced by roaring machines in steel-clad factories, sugar began its journey as a humble plant, chewed raw in the heat of ancient tropical forests. The story begins in Southeast Asia, where sugarcane, a towering bamboo-like grass, was first domesticated over 10,000 years ago. Historical evidence suggests that by around 8,000 BCE, people in what is now New Guinea and Indonesia were chewing the stalks of wild sugarcane for the sweet juice hidden inside. There were no presses, no crystals, and certainly no packaging, just simple enjoyment of nature syrup. It wasn't until around the 5th century CE that the real transformation happened. In India, one of the earliest cradles of scientific and agricultural advancement, people discovered how to boil sugarcane juice into crystals. This was revolutionary. Now, sweetness could be stored, transported, and traded. The Sanskrit word, sharkara, meaning gravel or ground sugar, even gives us the modern term sugar. This crystallization process, though rudimentary, compared to today's industrial scale, marked the birth of refined sugar as a substance and as a commodity. From India, sugar's fame spread like wildfire. It moved westward with traders and conquerors. By the 7th century, knowledge of sugar processing had reached Persia. From there, the expansion continued into the Arab world, where sugar was further refined and prized for its medicinal properties. It was considered a treatment for everything from stomach ailments to melancholy. Then came Europe. During the Crusades, European knights and merchants encountered sugar in the Middle East and brought it back home. At first, it was a luxury only the elite could afford rarer than spices, more expensive than gold. But as Europe's appetite for sweetness grew, so did its determination to control its production. By the 16th and 17th centuries, European colonial powers, particularly Portugal, Spain, France, and Britain, began establishing massive sugar plantations in the Caribbean, South America, and Africa. Here, in the brutal heat, millions of enslaved Africans were forced to plant, harvest, and process sugarcane. The sugar trade became one of the main engines of the transatlantic slave economy. It's a dark chapter in the sweet story of sugar, one that left scars still visible today. By the 18th century, sugar wasn't just a luxury anymore. It was a staple. It fueled global trade, fed empires, and transformed diets. Tea, coffee, and chocolate all became sweeter, literally and economically. Then came the Industrial Revolution and sugar's next evolution. Factories replaced plantations as the center of sugar production. Steam-powered mills, centrifuges, and later vacuum pans made it possible to extract and crystallize sugar faster, cleaner, and on a scale the world had never seen before. And with this new demand, innovation followed. Enter the sugar beet. Unlike tropical sugarcane, sugar beets thrive in colder climates. In the early 19th century, European scientists discovered that these pale, knobby roots could produce sucrose just as efficiently as cane. As wars and blockades disrupted cane imports, countries like France, Germany, and Russia began investing heavily in beet cultivation. By the late 1800s, sugar beets accounted for a significant chunk of Europe's sugar supply. Today, sugar is produced in two main ways. From sugar cane, which still accounts for roughly 80% of the world's supply, and from sugar beets, which dominate in cooler regions like Europe, Canada, and the northern United States. Sugarcane grows in towering stalks that can reach up to 6 meters tall, packed with juice inside their tough, fibrous cores. It's a tropical crop, thriving in hot, humid climates with plenty of rainfall. You'll find endless green fields of it swaying under the sun in countries like Brazil, India, and Thailand. Sugar beets, on the other hand, look like fat, white carrots. They're harvested from underground, with the sugar content stored directly in the root. Their growing cycle is shorter, their climate requirements are more flexible, and they're a staple crop in countries like Russia, France, the United States, and Germany. 
So who leads the sugar race today? Brazil is the undisputed giant, producing over 40 million tons of sugar annually, more than any other nation. It exports massive quantities of both sugar and ethanol, derived from molasses and bagasse byproducts. India follows closely behind, not just as a top producer, but also as a massive consumer. Then comes China, Thailand, and the United States, each with a significant share of global output. Combined, the world churns out more than 180 million metric tons of sugar every year. To picture that, imagine 72,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools filled with sugar crystals. That's how much sweetness we extract from the earth annually, and demand is only growing. And it all begins in the dirt, with crops, with cultivation, with weather patterns, labor, and logistics. Yet, growing the crop as vast and complex as that is only the first step. Because turning a thick, woody stalk or a knobby root into a bag of snow-white, pearly, granulated sugar is not as easy as it looks. That takes one of the most sophisticated, precise, and massive industrial processes in the world. And that's exactly what we're here to explore. Processing from plant to crystal. Step 1. Harvesting and delivery. The journey of sugar begins where all sweetness is born in the vast, sun-drenched fields. In sugarcane-producing regions like Brazil, India, and Thailand, the harvest is a high-speed, high-stakes operation. Enormous mechanical harvesters, often the size of small houses, rumble through the rows of cane. With surgical precision, they slice each stalk clean at its base, strip away the leaves, and chop the remaining cane into uniform, foot-long pieces, known as billets. These billets are then loaded into massive trucks and hauled off to the factory at breakneck speed. Time is everything. Sugarcane begins to lose its sucrose content the moment it's cut. To preserve maximum sugar yield, it must be processed within 24 to 48 hours. Any delay means wasted sweetness, wasted profit. Sugar beets follow a slightly different path. Harvested in cooler climates, they're plucked from the soil using powerful beet lifters, shaken clean, and piled into towering mounds for transport. Unlike cane, beets can be stored for several weeks under the right conditions, giving factories a bit more breathing room. But once either crop reaches the factory gates, there's no time to waste. The clock is ticking. The real transformation is about to begin. Step 2. Washing and Preparation Before the real magic begins, there's one essential task, cleaning. Sugar cane and sugar beets arrive at the factory straight from the fields, and they bring the fields with them. We're talking mud, stones, dead leaves, stray roots, and sometimes even curious insects hitching a ride. So the first stop is a massive water flume a rushing channel of water that carries the raw material through the initial rinse, loosening dirt and flushing away unwanted debris. Next, conveyor belts take over, moving the crop into rotating drums and high-pressure spray systems that scour every surface. It's an industrial bath designed to leave nothing behind but the clean, raw plant. Clean, yes, but still just a stick or a root. Now comes preparation. Sugarcane heads into a series of industrial-strength knives and crushers, these machines slice, tear, and pulverize the stalks, breaking open their tough, fibrous walls to access the sweet juice within. Sugar beets take a different path. They're sliced into thin, uniform strips called cossets. Think curly fries of sugar. This step dramatically increases the surface area, making it easier to extract every drop of sucrose in the next phase. The raw is now ready. Step 3. Juice Extraction Here's where the real magic begins, the moment when solid plant matter starts its transformation into liquid sweetness. In sugarcane factories, the shredded stalks are fed into a line of massive counter-rotating rollers, each one easily the size of a small car. These industrial giants exert enormous pressure, crushing the cane and squeezing out every possible drop of juice. This process is called milling, and it usually happens in five to seven successive stages. With each pass, more juice is extracted, leaving behind bagasse, a dry, fibrous material that looks like hay. But it's far from waste. In fact, bagasse is often burned in high-efficiency boilers to generate steam and electricity, making many sugar mills entirely self-sufficient in energy. Beets, being more solid and less fibrous, follow a different path. The thinly sliced cossets are loaded into large vertical or horizontal diffusers, where hot water gently circulates around them. Over time, the heat and flow leach out the sugar, much like steeping a giant, hot, vegetal tea. The sugar-laden water is collected as juice. 
At this stage, whether from cane or beet, the juice is murky, brownish yellow, and full of natural impurities, but the sweetness is in there waiting to be purified. Step 4. Purification Now we clean it. The juice extracted from sugarcane or sugar beets is anything but clean when it first emerges from the mills and diffusers. It's a murky yellow-brown liquid filled with dirt, plant fibers, proteins, waxes, and all sorts of organic impurities that simply don't belong in your sugar bowl. To turn this raw juice into something usable, factories turn to chemistry. The first step is adding lime or calcium hydroxide to the juice. In some cases, carbon dioxide is also introduced. This combination triggers a process called carbonatation, where unwanted particles clump together, forming a sludge that settles to the bottom or can be filtered out. In the case of sugarcane, an additional step called sulfitation is often used. Here, sulfur dioxide gas is bubbled through the juice. This not only helps to clarify it, but also bleaches the juice, making it brighter and more visually appealing. Once treated, the juice is heated to speed up chemical reactions and pass through multiple layers of filtration. The result? A translucent golden amber syrup significantly purer, noticeably sweeter, and now clean enough to move forward in the sugar making process. It's chemistry at industrial scale, sweet scientific alchemy. Step 5. Evaporation Now comes one of the most critical stages in the entire sugar making journey, water removal. After being purified and clarified, the juice still contains a high percentage of water, far too much to form sugar crystals. To concentrate it, the juice enters multi-effect evaporators, which are towering multi-chambered machines designed for maximum efficiency. These evaporators work using a clever principle. Steam is used not just once, but multiple times. In the first chamber, live steam heats the juice, causing the water to begin evaporating. The vapor produced from this first stage is then reused as the heating medium for the next chamber and so on, across four to six stages. This multi-effect system dramatically reduces energy consumption, making the entire process both powerful and economical. As the juice moves through each chamber, it becomes thicker, darker, and richer in sugar concentration. The aroma intensifies and the transformation becomes visible, thin juice gradually turning into viscous golden syrup. By the end of this stage, more than half the water has been removed, and what's left is a dense syrup containing 60-70% to sugar. It's sticky, sweet, and ready for the next big step, crystallization. Step 6. Crystallization with the syrup now thick and sugar-rich, it's time for one of the most mesmerizing parts of the process, crystallization. The golden syrup is carefully transferred into massive sealed vessels known as vacuum pans. These are towering metal tanks, engineered to boil liquids under reduced atmospheric pressure. Why reduce the pressure? Because doing so lowers the boiling point, allowing the syrup to boil without burning or caramelizing, which helps preserve the purity and light color of the final sugar. Once inside, the syrup is heated, and then comes the magic moment. Tiny particles of sugar known as seed crystals are introduced into the mix. These microscopic grains act like anchors, giving the dissolved sugar in the syrup something to grab onto. Slowly but surely, millions of sugar crystals begin forming around the seed. As the syrup continues to boil and concentrate, the crystals grow in size and number. The entire mixture thickens and takes on a gritty texture. By the end of the stage, what you have is a sticky, grainy, brownish paste called mesequite, a thick slurry made of raw sugar crystals suspended in molasses, and it's nearly ready for separation. Step 7. Centrifugation To separate the sugar crystals from the thick, sticky molasses, the mesequite, a dense mixture of syrup and crystals, is poured into massive industrial centrifuges. These machines resemble giant washing machines, but instead of cleaning clothes, they're designed to perform one incredibly precise task, separating solids from liquids using the power of centrifugal force. Once loaded, the centrifuge spins at blistering speeds, sometimes over 1,000 revolutions per minute. As it spins, the heavier sugar crystals are pushed outward, clinging to the walls of the drum, while the lighter molasses is flung outward through tiny perforations in the metal casing. The result? A clean break between liquid and solid. But we're not done yet. The crystals, though mostly pure, still carry traces of sticky molasses. So as they spin, they're gently washed with hot water or steam, removing the last remnants of brown syrup and revealing the product we all recognize, sparkling white sugar crystals. The process is fast, efficient, and a little mesmerizing to watch. 
Within moments, what started as a muddy, dense mass is transformed into clean, dry sugar, ready for drying, cooling, and eventually the journey to your kitchen. Step 8. Drying and Cooling Freshly spun sugar may look like the finished product, sparkling white and granular, but at this stage it's still wet and warm, straight out of the centrifuges. If left in this state, the sugar would clump, ferment, or even spoil. So the next crucial step is to remove the last traces of moisture and bring the temperature down. To do this, the sugar is conveyed into massive industrial dryers, typically rotary drum dryers and fluidized bed dryers. Rotary dryers are giant, slowly rotating cylinders where sugar tumbles gently as warm air circulates around it, evaporating surface moisture. Fluidized bed dryers, on the other hand, use jets of heated air from below to suspend the dry sugar particles as they float almost like popcorn in midair. This phase is all about precision. Too hot and the sugar could caramelize or brown. Too cool and the moisture wouldn't fully evaporate. Operators constantly monitor airflow, temperature, and humidity to achieve the perfect finish. Once cooled and dried, the sugar is free-flowing, shelf-stable, and ready to be stored for months or even years without degrading. Only now is it finally ready for its next destination, packing and shipping. Step 9. Packaging and Storage At last, after all the crushing, boiling, clarifying, crystallizing, and drying, we arrive at the final stage, packaging and storage. This is where raw industrial muscle meets pinpoint automation. The finished sugar, now cool and gleaming white, flows seamlessly into automated packing lines. These are high-speed systems equipped with sensors, robotic arms, and conveyor belts that rarely stop moving. Everything is calibrated down to the gram. Depending on where the sugar is headed, the packaging varies. For industrial customers like bakeries, beverage companies, or candy manufacturers, sugar is poured into massive 50-kilogram sacks stacked 10 feet high on wooden pallets. For everyday shoppers, the same crystals are funneled into neat, labeled 1-kilogram retail bags, just like the ones you'd see at your local supermarket. Every single bag is weighed for precision, heat-sealed to preserve freshness and stacked with robotic arms that work faster than the human eye can follow. It's efficient, clinical, and oddly satisfying to watch. From the field to the final bag, this entire transformation can happen in as little as 24 hours all under one roof, all running like clockwork. Bonus: What happens to the byproducts? Sugar factories are models of zero waste efficiency. The bagasse, dry fibrous pulp left after crushing sugarcane, is burned to generate steam for the plant's own boilers, often powering the entire factory and sometimes even contributing excess electricity to the local grid. Molasses, the thick brown syrup left after crystallization, is sold for animal feed, fermentation in alcohol production, and ethanol biofuel. Even the mud and lime sludge filtered out during juice purification isn't tossed. It's dried and repurposed as a soil container for farming. In the world of sugar, almost nothing is wasted. It's industrial alchemy at its finest. If you're enjoying this deep dive into the high-speed world of sugar processing, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Factory X brings you fascinating stories of how the world's most iconic materials are made in millions of tons, at staggering speeds. So, next time you tear open a sugar packet at your favorite cafe, just remember, it's not just sweetness in that little sachet. It's 10 tons of machinery, 5 stories of spinning steel, and a whole factory working like a finely tuned orchestra. Sweet, isn't it? Thanks for watching Factory X. Subscribe if you want more massive machines, epic processes, and a sprinkle of industrial magic. See you in the next one.